Well, good morning, New Hope. Good to see you out today. Thanks for being here. Um, you all are so gracious today. I come up and you get very quiet. You don't normally do that, all right? You're normally talking, and that's good. I had two services this week. One was here and one was uh, yesterday at Boyce. And, uh, I mean, everybody was visiting before, and I walk up to the podium, and it got quiet. I looked at him. I said, y'all need to come to New Hope and train our church family, all right? <laughs> I said, you all show so much respect, all right, that it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, <laughs> well, you guys were terrific today. Thanks for being here. Hey, if you are a guest today, we are honored to have you with us. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. We would love for you to take one, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by. Uh, we are going to uh, send you some information through the mail, not on the telephone, not knocking at your door, but through the telephone, and, I mean through the mail. We're going to give you information that tells you what we believe and the background of our church and what our staff is like and all the various ministries and services that are open to you. And we'd love to get that information in your hands. And as I told them in the 8 o'clock service, one of these days, too, we might take those cards and have a drawing and give away a brand new car. Um, <laughs> it, it, it could happen, all right? It just might. So anyway, thank you for doing that. Those cards are also, as you know, for our regular church family. Uh, if you've got prayer requests, uh, messages to staff, set up appointments, please use those. Change of address and information, please use those cards and put them in the offering when it comes by so uh, we can tend to those things that are on there. Um, Two things about the construction process, all right, remodel process that's going on. Uh, would you please raise the back screen for those of you who didn't arrive early enough to see this. Uh, here is the big difference since last Sunday. There is now a rock slate wall there, all right. Number two, that is the same cross. It is not smaller, all right. It's just not hanging, all right. It's, it's leaning today, all right. And it hasn't been hung yet. Um, uh, it will get up there. We'll also having a couple of other things made that we can change what's up there so it's not always the same. But anyway, that is the, uh, uh, the latest major thing. Uh, the floor is now finished. The only thing not complete on the floor is uh, the trim on the step. Yes, we know this is a light trim. This is a matching trim. I know that, okay? <laughs> I know that it's two-toned on the bottom, all right? That is because they made two goops on the order, all right? The first, they sent us the light trim, and, and they said, oh, we didn't send you the matching trim, and so they ordered it. And then we said, no, we think we want the light trim because it's a safety issue. People can see the step, all right? So we want that, and then they didn't order enough of the lighter trim. Uh, so I didn't want blue tape another Sunday, so... Uh, they went ahead and put this trim on. When the lighter trim arrives, it will all be matched this week, all right? So we are slowly getting there. Uh, we have some paint work to do still on the stage. And then the majority of the, and sound, sound will get complete this week. And Milo is going to say amen to that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> really, Milo has, has uh, to, to get things ready, because portable sound is back there in that room, Okay. Uh, so in order to do sound, it all gets carted away. He has to bring it back uh, on the day before, get everything set up, and uh, it just is a really long process. So he's going to be very grateful. But that should be done on Thursday and Friday. By next Sunday, we should be getting really close to having this part of the project finished. So thank you for your patience, and I hope you are enjoying some of the uh, modifications. You may put, yes, there you go. You can put that screen back down. Let me highlight a couple of announcements, and then we'll get engaged in, uh, in our worship today. Um, not a lot said today, but just you might want to put this date on your calendar, September the 2nd. I know that's a holiday weekend, but our men's and women's ministries are going to be sharing together with what's going on at uh, Bulldog Stadium. There's going to be a tailgate event uh, for, for, for families from churches, and we're going to participate. If you need tickets for that game, you can see Mark at us, and uh, this is for tailgating and tickets. It should be a great time. Uh, ladies, notice there's a couple of events in here for you. These are not specifically New Hope sponsored events. These are community events. And so Fawn's putting that information there for you. Contact information for both of them are uh, in the program. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, reach out and touch base with Fawn. Um, man camp. All right, guys, get this on your, your calendars, October 20th to 22nd. Uh, this is up at uh, Edison Campgrounds by Shaver Lake. Last year was the first annual so this will be the second annual man camp. 
Uh, this is all. Now, let me, trust me, that picture looks nothing <laughs> like man camp. I got up for three hours on Saturday last year. I'm not going to be able to make it at all this year, unfortunately. But uh, trust me, there were very few tents. It basically was a competition of who has the biggest RV, okay? Uh, fifth wheels, motorhomes, they were, all right. There were a few tents, but even those were pretty nice, all right? Um, and if you don't have a tent, you might be able to book a room, all right, in an RV. Uh, uh, for the right price, anything's possible. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was also about where you were staying and what you could eat, all right? I do know also, men, there were a few cylindrical objects to be found up there. That's cigars for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about. So anyway, this is not well, this is not what we would call a spiritual retreat. This is a men's getaway. All right, uh, there's a there's devotion Bible Bible in, in the evening, but uh, the rest of the time it's guys relaxing, enjoying each other's company, and getting acquainted. So uh, please contact Mark Addis uh, as you have interest in that. Tonight is going to be our second sizzling summer Sunday night schedule. Uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we had our first Sunday night event at 6 p.m., and uh, Mark did a great job uh, leading that and sharing the message with us. Uh, tonight, uh, our youth pastor, Chris, is going to be delivering the message. He's going to be talking about rest, relax, and recharge. Uh, all the Sunday night events that we are doing during the summer really tie into summer vacation time, all right? And so tonight, 6 o'clock, we hope you'll come be here uh, 6 to 7.15. We had a great time two weeks ago. We will be doing it again two weeks from now. Uh, I get to lead that one, and uh, we're going to be talking about laughter. Okay, laughter and joy, and uh, that's what summer ought to be all about. I think they chose it more for my appearance than they did what I might say that night, all right? So uh, anyway, those are some things that are scheduled, and we're looking to start this on a regular basis come the fall. Uh, Wednesday night, July 19th, is going to be family night here at the church. Uh, barbecue, water slides for the kids. Uh, this is a freebie, all right? No cost for the evening. Widow's Lunch Bunch is not going to lunch. They're going to dinner for a change on a Monday night. So take notice of that date in your uh, bulletin, all right? Uh, the information is on there where they're going, and contact information is there. So please take note uh, of that. Harvest of Blessing, time change and date change. It is in your program now. We mentioned it last week. It will be October the 29th. That's a Sunday evening. Uh, this is a twofold event. One, it's kicking off the fall season. So as a result, we want to be very grateful for God's generosity in our church life over these last, these last several months, but also over the last 25 years. Uh, this Sunday will be, that, that Sunday in October, uh, we are going to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of New Hope as the merged church. If you're new here, you may not realize 25 years ago in October, we merged a church I was pastoring in Fresno to this church location that was here, and uh, we started out with about 140 people. And so God has been very kind and generous to us over the last uh, 25 years, and we want to celebrate that on that particular evening. All right? Um, the sign-up sheet that's coming around, just one thing. It's the same that we sent around last week. Uh, but what Mark Addis, our associate pastor, is going to be kicking off in the fall is a Sunday prayer team. And what this basically means, let me, before, you, before that gets very far, so I'll pause that just a moment. Putting your name and contact information in here is not a commitment to be part of this prayer team. What that is is a commitment that you will try to come to the informational meeting where everything will be explained of what Mike's desi uh, Mark's desires and hopes are for uh, this particular ministry and outreach to be available on Sunday mornings. You would like to know more about it. Here's the basic concept, that somebody would be willing, a few individuals would be willing to be over in a room that we're going to designate as our prayer room, which is adjacent to the nursery, uh, 15 minutes before service starts and maybe 15 minutes after service is over. So that individuals coming or going from services between our three services would be available to pray with someone who has a, a need or a particular desire or request to pray with somebody about something going on in their life. It may be as a result of the message. It may be as a result of some circumstance you've been through this past week. But you would just like some personal one-on-one -on -one prayer with somebody. And so if that would be of interest to you, you're not going to be a counselor. You're going to be somebody who will pray, an act of compassion with somebody else. If that is of interest to finding out more about that, put your name and contact information on that sign-up sheet. 
I believe that wraps up all of our announcements. Let me highlight a couple of prayer requests. Uh, Joni Jarbo Anderson. Joni, stand up back there if you would. Just uh, put name to face. All right, that's that delightful lady back there. Um, uh, Joni just, just found out this week that she has breast cancer. Uh, don't have a lot of information yet on uh, the full extent of that. I, I have not heard. I be, what I heard was we think it's early stages. Is that accurate? Okay. Uh, there's more testing to be done and more decisions to be made. But please be in prayer for Joni as she goes through this process. She would appreciate that so much. Uh, Cash Parker is a new one that's in there this week. A young man, nephew of Shelley Parker here in our church. Would appreciate you remembering to pray for, uh, for Cash. One that's not in the bulletin, Dick Reynolds. Uh, he's a retired employee of Cal Fire, though during the last two summers he's gone back to work for them in the summertime. Uh, Dick is doing that right now, but he sent me a text late yesterday saying, Tim, I want you to pray for my former boss's family. His former boss uh, died under unusual and unexpected circumstances this week. Caught his entire family off guard. Uh, it's a very challenging time for them, and I, I, unfortunately, Dick did not give me their last name. So if you just remember Dick's boss's family, God knows who we're talking about that. By the way, uh, Dick's a very knowledgeable guy about fires. And as you know, they're fighting a big fire over out of Avenel right now, something like 47,000 acres. He let me know on Friday when he was here helping set up for a memorial service that this cloud cover that you see coming through kind of in waves are, probably, are not really clouds. They are, uh, they are the residue from fighting the fire. All right, so that is smoke. As water is applied, smoke goes up. It carries the, uh, some of the moisture with it. So that's why uh, on occasion, for a few hours at a time, we experience higher humidity. And then it kind of dissipates. And then it flares back up again. And so uh, just a little Cal Fire insight into what's going on here right now. Uh, and uh, one name that's not in there is this past week also was the memorial service for Bill Hoover. Uh, Longtime uh, attenders and members here at New Hope. I cannot remember a time in my life in which I did not know Bill Hoover. Um, Bill Hoover moved out here from Oklahoma when Dad was starting a church in Coway in uh, the mid-1950s. And when they first arrived here, I was three years old, and they lived in our home for about a month before they found their own housing. So as far as my memory goes back, there was always uh, a Bill Hoover. And uh, Bill Hoover was 87 years old, and he went home to be with the Lord, and his service was uh, this past Friday afternoon. So please be praying for Rita and his two daughters. I know they would appreciate that so very, very much. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, if they would, please, at this time, and wait on us as we have our tithes and offering. Um, okay, just got, uh, just got a message from Mark Downs, who is uh, in Mexico, I believe, right now. Uh, this is his first anniversary, okay? So Mark is uh, on his uh, first anniversary trip. He said, um, I just got some sad news. Uh, he lost his niece. Her name was Hope at 12 years old last night. Her heart stopped. Uh, this is uh, my sister's daughter. Please ask the church to keep us in your prayers. So we want to be remembering Hope's family at this time. All right, you might text him back and see if there's any way we can help. All right. Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father, we love you. We thank you so much for um, your incredible love for us. I'm grateful, God, that um, you always show up. You show up in the blessings of our life. You show up in the mundane events of our life. You show up in the uncertain and tragic times in our life. You always show up. You never fail to be there. And you're always prepared to meet our needs. What you don't do is force us to trust you. What you don't do is force us to follow your leadership. What you don't do is make us allow you to be at work in our lives. So, Father, thank you that you always show up and you are always on time. You are never late. Father, I pray that those of us who say that we are your children, that we will allow your character to be reflected in us. You tell us that we will love our enemies. You tell us that we should be kind to those who might be spiteful. You tell us to be grateful in advance of your blessings. You tell us to be available to love our neighbors. So, Father, we pray, thank you for Dick of loving his former boss and wanting others to be praying for that family. 
Father, you want us to love Mark's extended family that maybe many in this room have never, ever met. And you want us to be your hands and your feet at this moment in those lives. May you find us willing and available and responsive to your leadership. Father, we trust you for Joni as she's going through this this season of uncertainty in her own life, waiting for uh, next steps and next, next direction. We pray she will experience the peace that passes all human understanding. She will live out what Habakkuk has been telling us the last few weeks out of that little prophetic book of the Old Testament, the righteous shall live by faith in times of uncertainty. And so, Father, may she not only choose to live by faith, but may her faith be encouraged by her church family as we gather around her. Father, for the privilege of giving and sharing today, we say thank you. I pray that there's not a one of us who gives because we're trying to earn brownie points with you. I trust we don't give so that you'll like us more, but I trust we give, Father, as a gracious expression of your kindness and your favor on us. And that, Father, we give knowing that you do far more with our less than we can do with our all. And so we give to you today with a joy-filled heart. We say thank you for all of this. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn to the book of Habakkuk. All right, the book of Habakkuk. If you've been here the last few weeks, you know exactly where to find it. Or you put the bookmark you got a few weeks ago in Habakkuk, and that tells you right where it is. If you have been gone for a few weeks on vacations and traveling, or you are visiting for the first time, the book of Habakkuk is a minor prophet. It is found in the latter part of the Old Testament. It's tucked in between Nahum and Zephaniah. If that didn't help you any, then it's between Psalms and Matthew. All right? Uh, that'll give you two big benchmarks. It's only four pages long in my Bible. It's three chapters, 56 verses. And uh, it's sort of a, a, a short uh, book that we're going through during our summer months. Habakkuk is a most unusual book. There is not another book like it in all 66 books of the Bible. Uh, for what we have recorded in these three chapters is a literal conversation with God. We are getting a, a personal insight. We're getting to eavesdrop into a prayer. And we are getting to experience both sides of the prayer. This is the kind of prayer that prayer was designed to be. We talk, we listen. We listen, we talk between us and God. And so there's no other book like it anywhere else. There are, are small snippets in other books of these kind of things taking place, but this is literally the entire book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is called a minor prophet, not because its truths are less important than the truths written in the major prophets. It strictly is a minor prophet because it is a small book. It has to do with length, not quantity of what is being said. Uh, Habakkuk is having this conversation with God because Habakkuk is upset. Habakkuk is angry. He's angry with the people that he's to be preaching to, and he's angry at God. Have you ever had prayers and conversations with God at moments like that? If you're honest, you probably have. Um, and God can handle our angry conversations. Uh, these are uncertain times for Habakkuk. He is uncertain what's going to happen with Judah. That's the uh, uh, part of Israel that God has placed him uh, to be the prophet to. And uh, they are ignoring God. They have been running from God. They are living despicable lives. And, and Habakkuk, quite frankly, doesn't know what to do with the people he has been entrusted with their spiritual development. So this is uh, a prayer of anger. This is a prayer of uncertainty. This is a prayer at a time in life in which Habakkuk was confused. I love this prayer because I think just about every single one of us can identify with seasons of life just like that. You've either been there, you're there right now, or you're probably heading into one of these seasons. And so there are some valuable things for us to learn out of the book of Habakkuk. The key verse of this entire book is found in chapter 2, verse 4. The second part of verse 4, the righteous shall live by faith. In the midst of all of his frustration, in the midst of all of his complaining, even his criticism of God, in this, this season of uncertainty and anger, the revelation is pretty loud and clear. The righteous 
shall live by faith. You and I are familiar with uncertainty. Uncertainty can often create within us a critical spirit, a critical attitude. Um, Sometimes uncertainty and a critical spirit um, prompts us to not see things, one, as they really are, and number two, to not see ourselves in the way in which we are. Probably have never come across a better illustration of that than the following story. There was a man who wanted to impress his friends with his knowledge and his eye of fine art. And so he went with a group of friends to an art gallery together. He forgot his glasses, and he was very nearsighted. He couldn't hardly see the hand in front of his face, but he figured, I can wing this tonight. I know more about art than any of them do. This is abstract art anyway, so I can make some abstract observations and comments, and nobody will ever know the difference. So he approached a frame in the gallery, and instantly he began criticizing it. Why would anyone want to paint something as hideously ugly as that? I mean, that is a true rendering of the object, yes, but why waste time painting such a disgusting subject? Everyone was laughing by this time at the gentleman as he was making his comments. His wife leans over and whispers in his ear, John, you're looking in a mirror. (laughs) Sometimes, sometimes... And that is exactly what Habakkuk is doing as he engages in this conversation with God. Today, as we uh, begin to look at the whole of chapter 2, we're going to really be looking about the contrast of living by faith or living on self-sufficiency. Living by confidence in God or living a life of self-absorption. Eli Wessel wrote, After he was asked the question, how would you describe your faith, Eli uses the word wounded. He said, my tradition teaches that no heart is as whole as a broken heart. And so I would say that no faith is as solid as a wounded faith. I think that is a perfect description of Habakkuk as he writes this book. It's a perfect description. Habakkuk's faith is wounded. It's not dead. It's wounded. His faith is not absent, but it may be minuscule. It is Jesus who in the New Testament, words from his own lips, Jesus would say, it is not the size or the dimension or the expanse of your faith that is important to me. It is the purity of of the faith you have that is important. He said if it's the size of a grain of a mustard seed, the smallest thing he could use in the context of the people that he was speaking to, the smallest thing they could see with a human eye was the mustard seed. He said if you have that much faith, I can do incredible things like move mountains. What bigger mountains are there in our lives than the mountains of uncertainty? And so Habakkuk, in the midst of all of this, A wounded faith says, the righteous shall live by faith. Last week, as we looked at the first four verses of chapter 2, we discover, this is what Habakkuk said, I will stand at my watch, I will station myself on the ramparts, I will look to see what God will say to me, and what answer I am to give to this complaint. And then the Lord replied to him, write down the revelation I show you, make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it, you can pass it on. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of an end, and it will not prove false. It is very reliable. Though it linger, it's not late, but it may linger. You be patient. Wait for it. It will certainly come, and it will not delay. It will always show up at God's time. And last week... Just as way of review, what God shared through Habakkuk and, and Habakkuk shares with us in these few verses is that when we are facing uncertain times and crucial moments, what we really ought to do, first thing, is we need to withdraw from the stuff. Go to the ramparts, watch 
and wait. Withdraw some kind of fast, maybe a fast from other people's company, maybe a fast from some activity, maybe a fast, but something that drives our attention to watch and wait for God. The second thing he told us to do was to wait quietly and wait patiently. Reduce the interference in your life so that you can spiritually breathe normally. And then he says, watch and listen for God's direction. Meditate on God's truth and meditate on God's character. We often want to ascribe the character of our circumstance to the character of God. No, we need to ascribe the character of God to our circumstance. And then the fourth thing that he told us is what God speaks to you. And today we know this is his message to us. He'll speak this into our lives, and you and I are to apply it to the circumstances. And he said, write it down. Write the application of my truth down. Why? So that one, you don't forget it. And number two, you can pass it on, and it will be of benefit to others. In fact, the Scripture elsewhere tells us very specifically that some, one of the reasons why tough times sometimes comes in our life is so that we can take the lessons we've learned and we can pass them on to somebody else and help them in their moments of struggle. Today, in the remainder of our time, we're going to attempt to eat an elephant. We're going to try to do it one bite at a time, but we're going to try to look at the rest of chapter 2. So, let's just jump in. What I'm going to do first of all is do sort of an overview of the things that I think are really important out of chapter 2, and then I'm going to wrap it up in the last part of the sermon and look at some very, very practical things for our lives. Maybe take the whole of it and put it into a real practical way. What we'll ultimately see is there are five benefits of choosing God's direction, and there are five consequences of not choosing God's direction in times of uncertainty, difficulty, and frustration. So let's jump right in. We see in verses 1 through 3 what, uh, what Habakkuk is telling us is that we need to stand and see. I will stand on my watch, station myself. I will look to see what God will say to me. Stand and see. What does that say to us? Hey, we need to be in the right place with the right attitude. Trust me, I believe all of us on Sunday morning who choose to come to a place of worship uh, of the Lord Jesus, we are in the right place. But just being in the right place is not all that is important for this day to be all that God wants this day to be for you and me. Right place is good. Right attitude is essential. Am I willing to listen to the voice of God? Am I willing to listen to what God has to say to me? And am I willing to make the steps of God's leadership in my life, whether that is confession, whether that is repentance, whether that is apology, whether that is restoration, whether that is recovery, whether that is obedience, whatever it is, right time, right place, stand and see. You see, stand, that's, that's you and I recognize that what God might be about to say, I need to listen to, I need to pay attention. See, I'm going to discover and learn the benefits and the consequences of a faith-filled life and a self-absorbed life. Moving on um, from verses two, uh, through, 2 through 4, we're going to discover what the believer's conduct is. Uh, he talks about two things in these verses. A believer's con someone whose faith is in God, will be evident by two things. We will have confidence in the Word of God. Habakkuk said, you're to, Habakkuk said, God said, you are to write it down and pass it on. Habakkuk was writing the Word of God. You and I have the privilege of reading the Word of God. And you and I are to take this, apply it to our lives. It is Paul in the New Testament. Uh, might be, I think it's the book of Colossians. Uh, Paul says that God is going to write His Word on the softness of our heart. When we've had our old heart that is hard and stony removed, then on the fleshy tablets of this heart, God is going to write His truths. When we read this book, we want to hold it within our life. He'll write it in our hearts so that we can use it in those times of uncertainty and difficulty in our lives. We are to write it and pass it on. The second thing we are, uh, will be evident in the life of a believer in times of uncertainty is not only will we have confidence in God's Word, but we will also live by faith. Verse 4, the righteous will live 
by faith. You see, doubt sees obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night, but faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt questions who will believe. Faith says, I will. I will. What's the evidence of God in your life? Faith or doubt? Well, that's the believer's conduct as Habakkuk lays it out for us in these opening verses. But then he also tells us there is a conduct that's evident by unbelievers or non-believers. And that's found in verse 4 and 5. The first part of 4 says, See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. So we find a couple of things here. The unbeliever, as described by God through Habakkuk, the unbeliever is proud in his heart. It says he's puffed up. He's very proud of his own accomplishments. The second thing it says in verse 4 is he is perverse in his thoughts. His desires are not upright. He wants things he ought not to want. And the third thing it tells us in the part of verse 5 is his soul is restless. So an, an unbeliever is proud in his heart, perverse in his thinking, and restless in his soul. When Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are tired and weary and burdened down with life, come and I will give rest to your soul. This is exactly the kind of people Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about your need for a good nap physically. He wasn't talking about for you to get your eight hours of sleep. Jesus was talking about part of us that doesn't shut down when we sleep. Our mind that's racing with thoughts, our emotions that are out of control, our will that is confused with what direction to go. Jesus says, hey, come to me. I will give you a rest beyond your uncertainty. I will give you rest in spite of your uncertainty. Will you trust me? We need to beware of corruption. Habakkuk gives us some bewares in here. You'll find five verses that start with the word woe. Now, most of us did not say the word woe in any sentence this past week. It's not a normal, unless you were riding a horse, all right? That's a different kind of woe, all right? Um, but, uh, that's W-H-O-A, all right? This one is W-O-E, all right? And, and uh, it, probably a better term for us in 21st century is beware or watch out. But he gives us five of those woes in here. Beware of corruption. I think it's what Habakkuk wants to understand in all the forms that corruption can show up in our life. First off, in verses 6 through 8, he tells us to beware of corrupt possessions. Uh, let me read 6 through 8. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods, makes themselves wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your debtors arise and destroy you? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. He says, watch out for corrupt possessions. They will ultimately destroy you. They'll catch up with you. In verses 9 through 13, he tells us to beware of corrupt power. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain to set his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house, forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Watch out for corrupt power. It ruins lives, verse 10. It destroys your life, verse 12. Then the next woe tells us to beware of corrupt relationships. Verses 15 through 17. Woe unto him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You'll be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Drink and be exposed. Wow. Watch out for corrupt relationships. Relationships built around personal pleasure end in personal exposure i gotta be honest my perverted thoughts as i was reading through this said watch out about giving your neighbors drink because you know they'll expose them to i guess it depends on who your neighbor is all right but there's <laughs> there's a warning here no why because 
these verses are the foundational verses to a key bit of really strategic world philosophy. Some of you may have heard it. Some of you may have never heard it before. What goes around, ah, you've heard that prophet, all right? It got started here with a back. When you do this to others, guess what? You just wait. This is going to come back, and it's going to fall right back on you. Count on it. The fourth thing that he warns us, tells us to beware of, woe is corrupt gods, verses 18 and 19. Of what value is an idol since a man has carved it? Or the image that teaches lies, for he who makes it trusts in his own creation, he makes the idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver, and there is no breath in it. Watch out for corrupt gods. The gods you create because of your own self-absorption. Habakkuk tells us these gods are worthless since we've made them by our own hands, by our own imaginations. Verse 18, they are worthless because they do not speak. I, I, I cannot verify this, but knowing that Habakkuk was one of God's prophets, I'm pretty confident he knew Israel's history very, very well. I'm pretty confident that Habakkuk would have known many of the key stories in Israel's background. He probably knew the story of Elijah at the battle of Mount Carmel, the equivalent of Tombstone's OK Corral, when Elijah went to battle against 800 false prophets that Israel was following. They set up a duel on top of the mountain. They created two sacrifices, and the duel was this. Whose ever God swoops down from heaven and with fire consumes the sacrifice, that God will be God. And so Elijah said, you first. And 800 prophets of Baal, they prayed, they cried, they wept, they yelled, and nothing happened. And then Elijah pushed their buttons just a little bit. Elijah said, hey guys, maybe if you got a little louder, he might hear you. You might wake him up because he's asleep. Just get louder. Get closer. Maybe he's blind and can't see you. I suspect Habakkuk had that in mind when he wrote this. Come to life, you lifeless stones. Wake up. Listen to us. You see, corrupt gods are worthless because they don't speak. They have no power. They provide no direction according to verse 19. And they are absolutely lifeless because they were made by our own hands and imagination. Now in the midst in this chapter of all of this bad news, God has some good news. He scatters a verse in here and there throughout chapter 2 to continue to support our hope in Him. Those three assurances are His grace, His glory, and His government. Let's highlight those just for a moment. Verse 4. The second part, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul writes for us in Galatians chapter, um, oh, all of a sudden just the verse is escaping me. Um, for by grace are you saved. Give me the verse. I just went blank. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of works. Galatians 2, 8 and 9. Thank you very much. Showing my age. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Thank you. Uh, Galatians 2, 20 is I'm crucified with Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Um, For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of works. It is a gift of God so that no one can brag or boast. You see, without the grace of God... There will be no faith in God. It is by God's grace that faith is made available. It's not because we work for God's love that we receive God's love. It is by the grace of God that he extends his love and faith is made possible. Habakkuk had not read Hebrews chapter 11 yet, but again, because he was a prophet, he knew the facts of Hebrews chapter 11 before it was ever written. 
Because Hebrews chapter 11 is just a Reader's Digest version of great moments in the life of the people of God. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Elijah. By faith, David. By faith, Deborah. It is through the grace of God that you and I can depend upon faith in the moments of uncertainty in our life. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord in a great moment of uncertainty, of pending world destruction. Abraham and Sarah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because of Abraham's faith. God made them the father and the mother of his chosen people. David, in spite of his sin with Bathsheba, found favor and grace in the eyes of the Lord because of his faith that said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You see, you and I, in the midst of uncertainty, can live on the basis of faith because of the generous grace of God. His glory, found in verse 14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. In the midst of all of this confusion, uncertainty, and anguish, man, here is an oasis island right there for us. God's glory will fill the earth. The presence of God will not abandon the faithful in uncertain times. Think back with me to the day of crucifixion. Think about the attitude of the disciples and the family of Jesus. They thought they had lost Christ forever. Satan thought he had defeated and destroyed his influence forever. And then just three days later, what happens? (laughs) The resurrection. And the disciples say, yeah, he's back. Well, they didn't quite say it like that. They were still a little scared, a little tentative. It took them a little while. You know, really? You're back? I mean, you have to do it this way? Isn't that the way we kind of are when God chooses to act in our world? We really should be saying, yeah, when we're a little timid. And then after a few months, it's the ascension, Acts chapter 1. If you're not familiar with it, go read it. Jesus said, I'm going to leave you again. This time, not at the hands of crucifixion, but at the hands of my Father as he brings me home. The scripture says they stood there gazing and watching. They wanted to get their very last step. I can almost imagine in their minds, he's he's leaving again. And Jesus said to them, hey, hey, what I'm doing is important. What I'm doing is significant. Because when this physical presence you see in time and space leaves you, what I am leaving in my place is who I am in the person of the Holy Spirit so that I don't have to be on a beach where you are in order to be with you. I am going to give the Holy Spirit, who is me, into your human spirit, so that wherever you are, I am. Wow! His presence shall flood the earth with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord. Incredible. And then he wraps up this chapter with his government. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. You see, God is always where he's supposed to be. The real question is, are we? When he's in the right place, if if as children of God, he's living within us, are we in the right place? Are we silent before him? Or have we locked him in the closet, ignoring his presence in our life? You see, when he's in the right place, we need to be in the right attitude. And what he says, what Habakkuk says is, let all the earth be silent before him. In other words, Habakkuk says, hush. There's a time for you to stop talking and listen. Watch and see. Watch and wait. Stand and see. All right. Isn't it interesting? How sometimes you and I get mad at God when he doesn't seem to be paying attention to us the way we want him to pay attention to us. But when God does answer our prayers, we often don't like how he does it. Or when our prayers are answered the way that we would like for him to answer it, we kind of act as if we're responsible for it. Boy, God, I'm glad I gave you that idea. 
God, I'm glad you followed my direction. Well, it's because of the faith I had to pray to you that this worked out this way. You see, the bottom line is, folks, you and I are hard to please. We are very hard to please. What God wants from us is us to trust him enough to follow his direction. He wants us to grow up in him. But God isn't going to make us do anything. He gives us the opportunity to choose between trusting a God who is eternal, who is personal, who is holy, who is dependable, who always shows up on time, or we can follow an enemy who is rebellious and selfish and a destroyer of anything that is good. He says, you decide. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, enter the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many find that way, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and a lot fewer folks find that one. When we really look at life and circumstance, there's only two roads we can take. The road that leads to life or the road that leads to destruction. The road that leads to Christ. The road that leads to evil. The road that ends in heaven. The road that ends in hell. God shows us in this chapter 2 the benefits and the consequences of our decisions. And he allows us to decide. It's kind of like road signs. They're given to us so that we will know the law and the boundaries and the dangers that are ahead of us. We have to decide whether or not we're going to heed the signs. This requires some wise discernment. All of us discern things. It's not always wise discernment. Let me see if I can illustrate. In Texas, there once lived a bank robber by the name of Jorge Rodriguez. He had been so successful that Texas Rangers sent out a whole posse on his trail. For months they tried to catch him as he slipped back and forth on two sides of the Rio Grande. Finally, a ranger cornered Jorge in a saloon one night. Quietly, the ranger slipped up behind him, put a six-gun to Jorge's head, and the ranger said, I know who you are, and unless you tell me where you've hidden the the money from the bank, I'm going to blow your brains out. There was one problem. Jorge did not speak English. And the ranger did not speak Spanish. There was an enterprising little fellow there, though, who stepped up and said, "Uh, Ranger, would you like me to translate for you? The ranger said, oh, that would be most helpful. He was very discerning. So the translator told Jorge what the ranger had said. Jorge was scared to death. And he said, you tell that ranger he can have the money, but please don't pull the trigger. He then told the translator exactly where the money was hidden, and he begged for mercy. The translator took all this in and solemnly told the ranger, Jorge Rodriguez is a very brave man. He said he's ready to die. (laughs) I'm not sure who was more discerning at that moment, all right, the ranger uh, or the little fellow. But um, we need discernment in times of uncertainty. There are five benefits. There are five destructive things. Let's highlight those real quick, and I really can do this very quickly. Um, The first benefit, a sign that indicates that we are on the road to life, is our faith. Faith is trusting in something that our senses cannot accomplish. Faith is doing things without being able to know what the outcome is. Without faith, the Bible tells us, is impossible to please God, but the opposite holds true. The reward of our faith, trust, and dependence upon God is that we bring pleasure to Him. Number two, a sign that indicates that we are on the road to life is our righteousness. That means to be right with God. Jesus said that those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled with it. That beautiful song, all right, that your family sang for us this morning, I'm clean. That which was dirty has been made worthy. Man, the world needs to see that in the midst of our uncertain life. A sign that indicates that we're on the road that leads to life is our humility. To be humble means to lower ourselves, to realize that we are nothing. The Bible tells us if we will humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, that he will lift us up. We don't need to have to worry about lifting ourselves up. When the time is right, never late, God will lift us up. 
That's a confidence we can have in Him. A sign that indicates we're on the road that leads to life is our love for others. This is a key point. The Scripture tells us we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind. We are then told to love our neighbor as ourselves. And how do we love God that way? By obeying His commands and loving others just like we love Him and we love ourselves. The last way the sign indicates that we're on the road that leads to life is by our desires. What motivates us? Have we had our desires sanctified by the presence of God being in the right place and us having the right attitude? What's our priorities? The psalmist said God fulfills the desires of those who trust Him. He hears their cry and He saves them. Psalm 145, 19. While we can see all the wonderful blessings of trusting God, we also have to see the consequences of not. We see in this passage that God takes care of sin and rebellion. God wasn't punishing the Babylonians because of the fact they were Babylonians. He was punishing them because He's a just God and He cannot look upon sin. And God even used the punishment of the Babylonians as a means of punishing the people of of Judah because they were rebellious against God. What are the five warnings? They begin at each of the, the woes. A sign that indicates we're on the road to destruction is greed. God warns us to try not to gain things at the expense of others. We can lose those things as fast as we have gained them. In verses 9 through 11, there's the sign that indicates that we're on the road to destruction when we're selfish. God warns us to not think about ourselves first, but build, commit ourselves to what God wants to do, because our selfishness will soon be found out. Habakkuk 2, 12, and 13, a sign that indicates we're on the road that leads to destruction is by the way we treat others. God warns us to not try to get ahead by destroying other people. The consequences of storing things up on this earth is that we'll get our reward on this earth. Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. A fourth sign that indicates that we're on the road to destruction is in verses 15 through 18, and that is, that our guidance of others leads them to do wrong. God warns those who lead others into wrongdoing that they are trying to behave as a God over other people's lives, and it will bring self-destruction. And the last sign that indicates we might be on the road to destruction is in verse 19. Our putting everything else in our life ahead of God. You can choose to make whatever or whoever your God But there's no life in those things or those individuals or that circumstance. Eternal life only comes through Jesus Christ himself. And Habakkuk wraps up chapter 2 with verse 20. God is right where he's supposed to be. He's in his holy temple. When we don't understand, we need to hush, be still, wait upon God. That's how the righteous live by faith in times of uncertainty. You decide. Let me close with this story. I understand it is true. There was a seminary professor and his wife vacationing in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. One morning, they were eating breakfast at a little restaurant, hoping to enjoy a quiet family time together. While they were waiting for their food to arrive, they noticed this very distinguished gentleman roaming around the restaurant, visiting with all the guests, kind of hopping from table to table. The professor leaned over and whispered to his wife, I hope he doesn't come over here and bother us. But sure enough, in a matter of minutes, the man came over to their table. Where are y'all from? He asked in a friendly voice. Oklahoma, the professor answered. Great to have you here in Tennessee, the stranger said. What do you do for a living? I I, I teach at a seminary, he replied. "Uh, Oh, so you teach preachers how to preach, do you? Well, I've got a great story for you. And with that, the gentleman pulled up a chair, sat down at the table with the couple. The professor groaned and he thought to himself, great, just what I need, another preacher story. The man started. He said, see that mountain out there? Pointing to one outside the restaurant window. Not far from the base of that mountain, there was a boy born to an unwed mother. He had a hard time growing up because every place he went, he was always asked the same question. Hey boy, who's your daddy? Whether he was at school, the grocery store, the drugstore, people would always ask the question. Hey son, who's your daddy? 
He would hide at recess and lunchtime from other students. He avoided going into stores because in this small community, the question was always asked and it always hurt him badly. When he was about 12 years old, there was a new preacher who came to the church in his, in his neighborhood. He would always go in late and slip out early to avoid that new preacher, ask him the question, hey, whose family are you a part of? Who's your father? But one day, the new preacher said the benediction so fast, he got caught in the crowd walking out. Just about the time he got to the back door, the new preacher put his hand on his shoulder and, and he said, hey, son, I don't think I've noticed you before. Who's your daddy? The whole church got deathly quiet. He could feel every eye in the church looking at him. Not everyone, not everyone had known the answer. But in a matter of minutes, everyone would know. This new preacher, though, was very sensitive to the circumstances around him. And he used the discernment that only the Holy Spirit can bring at those kind of moments. And he said to that scared little boy, wait a minute, son, I know exactly who you are. I see the resemblance from the top of your head to the toe of your feet. You are a child of God. That little boy breathed a sigh of relief. The pastor patted him on the shoulder and said, Boy, you've got a great inheritance. Go out and claim it. With that, the boy smiled for the first time in a long time. He walked out that door of the church a changed child of God. He was never the same again. From then on, anytime anybody asked him the question, who's your daddy? He would say, I'm a child of God. The distinguished gentleman got up from the table and said to the people having breakfast, now isn't that a great story? The press professor honestly responded, it really was a great story. Thanks for sharing it. As the man turned to leave, he looked back at the couple and he said, hey, you know if that new preacher hadn't have told me I was one of God's children, I probably never would have amounted to anything. And he walked away. The seminary professor and his wife were stunned. He called the waitress over after a moment and he asked her, Ma'am, do you know who that man was that just left our table? The waitress grinned and said, Of course I do. Everybody knows him. That's Ben Hooper, the former governor of Tennessee. I am child of God. It's your choice and mine not only to be his child, but to be his faithful child in times of uncertainty and crisis. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so very, very much for working in Habakkuk's heart and by the motivation of, of the Holy Spirit driving him to write this book so that for thousands of years it could be recorded for us so that in the 21st century, in the summer of 2017, many of us could learn wise and slow. Father, if there's any uncertainty or doubt about any who are in this room of whether they are a child of God, I trust in these next couple of minutes that will be wiped out in the quietness of their mind and heart, they'll say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you to live in my life. I want to be known from this moment on as a child of God, that no matter what un uncertain things may happen in my life, I will become part of those who are called righteous because in seasons of uncertainty and trouble, I will live my life with faith in you. You are the God of God. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And I am your child. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Stay where it's cool.